Adolf Anton Wilhelm Volbrook, who was born in November 1896 and died in August 1967 at the age of 70, was an Austrian actor who settled in the United Kingdom under the name Anton Walbrook after serving as a prisoner of war during World War I. A popular performer in Austria and Weimar, Germany, he left it in 1936 and established a career in British cinema. Walbrook is perhaps best known for his roles in the original British film Gaslight, which defined the term for generations to come, The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, The Red Shoes, and Victoria the Great as Prince Albert. He is described on screen as cat-like, mysterious, debonair, continental. In recent years, the woke media have tried to put him in a pro-gay box, but the truth is much more complicated. Walbrook was born in Vienna, Austria as Adolf Volbrook. He was the son of Gisela Rosa Cohen and Adolf Ferdinand Bernard Hermann Volbrook. He studied the piano and violin before turning to acting. He was descended from ten generations of actors, though his father broke with tradition and was a circus clown. While still in his teens, he began studying under Max Reinhardt at the Deutsches Theater in Berlin. Although his theatrical career was interrupted by military service during the First World War, as he served as a war volunteer guard lieutenant. After spending time in a POW camp, he returned to acting after the war and made his name on stages in Munich, Dresden, Dusseldorf, and Berlin, with roles in over 200 productions. Although he appeared in a few silent films, it was only with the coming of sound that he really engaged with cinema, where his good looks and rich sonorous voice quickly made him arguably the most popular film star in 1930s Germany. He moved to Hollywood in 1936 for an English remake of one of his films, The Soldier and the Lady, changing his name to Anton Walbrook while there. Instead of returning to Germany, however, he sailed to Britain in 1937, where he was cast as Prince Albert in two lavish biopics about the life and reign of Queen Victoria, the Great Victoria. Walbrook returned to Germany after the war, but despite a number of successful theatrical performances, he found it harder to establish himself in the film industry there. Perhaps he was shocked by the genocide and war crimes committed on Dresden. Even though he had taken British citizenship in 1947, he did not feel quite at home in England either, and his post-war life was rootless, with alternations between Britain and Europe and a series of journeys hopping between minor TV films, musicals, operettas, and the occasional flashes of brilliance on both stage and screen. In 1936, he was in Hollywood to reshoot dialogue for the 1937 multinational The Soldier and the Lady, in which he portrayed the Jules Verne hero Michael Stroganoff, and he changed his name from Adolf to Anton, potentially for spelling on the bills. Rather than return to Germany, where he, the press claimed, risked persecution because he was a mixed race in the first degree as his mother was Jewish, which has been disputed, which we will get to, and because he was homosexual, which he discovered after abuse as a German prisoner of war, he settled in England, where he continued working as an actor specializing in playing continental Europeans. He played Otto in the first London production of Design for Living at the Haymarket Theatre in January 1939, which was so successful it transferred to the Savoy Theatre, and he ran for 233 performances in that play, opposite Rex Harrison as Leo. In 1952, he appeared at the Coliseum at, as Cosmo Constantine in Call Me Madam, also participating on the EMI cast recording. Producer-director Herbert Wilcox cast him as Prince Albert in Victoria the Great of 1937. He also appeared in its sequel, Sixty Glorious Years, in 1938. He was in Dickinson's version of Gaslight in 1940 in the role played by Charles Boyer in the later Hollywood remake. In Dangerous Moonlight of 1941, he was a Polish pianist torn over whether to return home. 
For the Powell and Pressburger team in The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp of 1943, he played the dashing, intense, good German officer Theo, and the tyrannical impresario Lermontov in The Red Shoes of 1948. One of his most unusual films, reuniting him with the director Dickinson, is 1949's Queen of Spades, a gothic thriller based on the Alexander Pushkin short story. For Max Olfus, he was the ringmaster in La Ronde of 1950 and Ludwig I, King of Bavaria, in Lola Montes. His Red Shoes co-star Moira Shearer recalled that he was a loner on set, often wearing dark glasses, as in his character costume in the film, and ate alone. Despite this, he was not a method actor. According to a recent exhibit at Top Sam Museum and Darkline Creative, Vivian Lee, best known for her role as Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, was born Vivian Hartley in India in November 1913 and had a strong friendship with Anton Walbrook. Like him, she was educated in a Catholic religious school. He was taught by the Catholic brothers in their Lazarin Kloster School in Chopin-Heierstrasse, she by the Sacred Heart Nuns at Roehampton and elsewhere. You can learn more about Vivian Lee in her videos on this channel. She showed a talent for drama from her early age and took a leading part in several school plays. The last two years of her education, from 1929 to 1931, were spent at a finishing school at Bad Reichenhall in the Bavarian Alps, run by Baron and Baroness von Roederer. From here, she regularly crossed the border into Austria, Anton's home country, to attend operas in Vienna and Salzburg. She also spent 10 days in Munich at the end of March 1931 and sat through eight hours of Parsifal. Walbrook was at this time in Berlin, appearing in Eine Koniliche Family, Victor Barnowski's production of the Broadway hit Poking Fun at the Barrymore Acting Family, who you can also learn about on this channel. But Walbrook would emulate John Barrymore in photographs and poses. By this time, Vivian spoke both French and German, perhaps to speak to her new friend, Walbrook. And she returned home to see Walbrook's first sound film, Salto Mortale, released in August 1931. As Adolf Walbrook, he appeared frequently in the German press, pre-war material from the period including postcards, film booklets, cinema programs, cigarette cards, several issues of the illustrated film Courier featuring Walbrook's films and other ephemera. When the Weimar period ended and Walbrook's face stopped appearing on cigarette cards and elsewhere, it must have been somewhat of a shock. The actor's passionate insistence on absolute separation between his private and public lives and his family's alleged destruction of personal papers relating to his homosexuality mean records about his life are largely missing, but a very thorough biography was published recently, A Life of Masks and Mirrors by James Downs. While Lee and her lover, Laurence Olivier, were filming Fire Over England, Walbrook had left Germany and was on his way to Hollywood, which he would dislike almost as much as Vivian. In the meantime, she was acting alongside another German émigré, Conrad Veidt, in the spy drama Dark Journey. Veidt has been cited as the original inspiration for the Joker character in the Batman series. Veidt hated the Nazis, just as Walbrook said he did, as the Nazis represented a danger to their degenerate lifestyles. The two actors undertook opposing methods of fighting the regime, which restricted their ability to star in degenerate homosexual vehicles, which you can learn about in the Weimar video on this channel. Veidt specialized in playing sinister German officers such as Baron von Marwitz, Captain Hart, and Major Heinrich Strasser, while Wahlberg played good Germans such as the peace-loving Hutterite Peter, Theo Kretschmar Schuldorf, and Kurt Muller, all of whom deliver eloquent and impassioned condemnations of the Nazis. In this way, the Germans, one of whom was supposedly half-Jewish, undermined their homeland. Both actors were effective in teaching British filmgoers to hate the Nazis, and somewhat subconsciously Germany in general. Olivier was not the only one from theatrical circles who joined the armed forces during World War II. Ralph Richardson served alongside Olivier in the Fleet Air Arm, while Vivian Lee's co-star from Gone with the Wind, Clark Gable, became a captain in the U.S. Air Corps and flew on bombing missions over Europe. Rex Harrison, whom... 
Walbrook had starred with before also joined the Royal Air Force. At this time, around the time of the start of the war, Walbrook was in a relationship with Norwegian artist Ferdinand Finn, who had joined the Norwegian Air Force after the invasion of Norway in April 1940. He had been working as a costume designer for the Norwegian National Theatre when he first met Walbrook on a train in France in 1938. They returned there in 1939, traveling together through Brittany and the south of France, as well as staying in Paris, where Finn's circle of acquaintances included Coco Chanel and Somerset Mom, who hunted young men, which you can learn about on this channel. After the German attack on Norway, Finn reported immediately to the Norwegian Embassy in London, which became the organizational base for Norwegian resistance. King Haken and his son, Crown Prince Olav, resided at the Norwegian legation in Kensington. Finn helped set up Little Norway, a training base in Canada for exiled Norwegian Air Force personnel. He was posted there while his boyfriend, Walbrook, was filming Dangerous Moonlight in 1941. Lee Walbrook and Admiral Halmar Rieser Larsen, founder of the Norwegian Air Force and the first commander of Little Norway, were photographed together during this time. Finn would die in 1999 and was knighted in the Royal Norwegian Order of St. Olaf in 1991. After the war, Walbrook joined Finn in Norway, buying an island and spending time at the actor's home and visiting places such as Lillesand, Langoya, and Fornebu in West Oslo. After Finn was asked to design the sets for a West End production of Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen's dark family drama The Wild Duck, he suggested that his boyfriend audition for the lead role of Hilmar Ekdal. Walbrook got the part and appeared in The Wild Duck at St. Martin's Theatre from November 1948 to March 1949. Their relationship ended that same year, which also saw Walbrook's disastrous and short-lived return to Germany. Walbrook's friend Vivian Lee died a sad, lonely death in July 1967, just one month before Walbrook. In 1955, Walbrook stated he had not done any film role since 1935 that he had not chosen for himself. Many of his films included the use of doubles, mirrors, masks, concealed identities, or characters who have a troubled relationship with their own past, often symbolized by a changed name. Does this sound familiar? The reasons why this might resonate with Walbrook are not hard to fathom. As a homosexual with Jewish ancestry, he learned to conceal his personal life from public scrutiny while living in Nazi Germany, and once he became an exile outside his country, his natural shyness became a defense mechanism, a protective barrier between the emigre and the otherness of the alien world around him. Many of his screen characters were exiles, such as Paul Mallon in Gaslight, Peter in the 49th Parallel, who declares, Our Germany is dead, Prince Albert, struggling to establish his own identity as prince consort in a country that remained hostile to his German foreign background and dismissive of his personal talents, or the good German Theo in The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, and the Polish airman Stefan Radetzky in Dangerous Moonlight, both of whom flee the expanding German Empire by emigrating to England, but struggle to reconcile their past and present lives. Despite his sonorous voice, Walbrook had trouble learning English fluently and was very embarrassed by this. Walbrook donated half of his fee for his role in Powell and Pressburger's 49th Parallel to the Red Cross. He also frequently played characters who possessed a strong outer shell, the Stoic, loners who remain aloof and detached from the world around them, such as Boris Lermontov in The Red Shoes and Hermann Svarin in The Queen of Spades, or as the Master of Ceremonies in La Ronde, who interacts with others while appearing to exist on another plane altogether, in a sort of repeat of the narrator in Make Peace Thackeray's Vanity Fair. If there is indeed a correlation between Walbrook's personal life and that of his on-screen performances in terms of a tendency towards secrecy, then perhaps we might hope to find a more objective record in his archives. But a large amount of his private papers were destroyed after his death, allegedly by the family of his partner Eugene Edwards, and records from Weimar Germany are incredibly difficult to come across. 
Eugene Edwards was a working-class London florist, 30 years Walbrook's junior. He outlived Walbrook by just three years and was interred with him in Hampstead Cemetery in 1970. In tracing this story, the biographer Downs had to admit that it seems likely that Edwards is the person referred to as Jimmy in Walbrook's letters, but we can't be sure who Jimmy was. So there is a doubt, especially due to the group's sex atmosphere of London at the time and mixing of love lives among homosexuals. In a crazy twist of fate, Walbrook has been buried right next to Arthur Llewellyn Davies, whose son the Llewellyn Davies boys became mixed up in the life and chaos of another potential homosexual J.M. Barry after his death. You can learn more about that mystery on this channel. Although Eugene Edwards lies there with Walbrook in a shared grave, Edwards isn't mentioned on the gravestone. And even today, a website detailing the history of Hampstead Cemetery insists that Walbrook's grave includes the ashes of his devoted secretary for 23 years. This had, could have been perhaps how Walbrook wanted it since he selected the plot himself, and he referred to many of his close friends throughout his life, including Alexander Bender, as his secretaries. There is no Walbrook archive that exists anywhere. Instead, we only have small groups of letters and papers held within other collections across the world. The star's archival body is fragmented and dislocated, allowing us only to glimpse Wahlberg through a secondary perspective as he is reflected in the eyes of others. Even in interviews, Walbrook insisted on absolute separation between private and public, warning journalists explicitly that certain questions were just too close. Walbrook's reputation in the modern world as a staunch anti-Nazi was far from clear, so much so that many German emigres in Hollywood suspected him of being a Nazi spy, and Jewish groups threatened to boycott his films. There is no reason to question Walbrook's opposition to the Nazis and the downfall of his lucrative Weimar career, but the archive revealed letters that he signed Heil Hitler, and there was a promotional card on which his portrait was adorned with a swastika. While modern accounts of Walbrook's emigration from Germany emphasize the danger he was in due to his mother being supposedly Jewish, there was no evidence from contemporary interviews that this was a real concern. Genealogical research revealed in his recent biography by Downs that his Jewish ancestors embraced Catholicism, at least a generation previously. So the reliability of the archival record has to be questioned on different grounds as the media runs with tales, fact or fiction. Could the detailed biographical information about his Lutheran and Catholic grandparents that he submitted to a government questionnaire in 1933 be trusted? Or were these fictitious statements meant to deter further investigation into his family credentials as he was a very private man? His mother's surname was, after all, a variation of Cohen. A wartime letter from his friend and secretary, Alexander Bender, contained comments about Walbrook's feelings about Hollywood, which contradicted what the actor told journalists in British film magazines. Walbrook retired from films in 1958 and in later years appeared on the German stage and television, never really willing to fully let his homeland go. He died of a heart attack on stage in the Grazhausen district of Fedolfing, Bavaria, Germany in, in 1967. His ashes were interred in the churchyard of St. John's Church, Hampstead, London, as he had wished in his will despite his return to Germany and seeming appreciation of it after the economic struggles of England after World War II. In Walbrook, we nearly see the struggle of the modern German, pulled in multiple directions, consistently creating and building, but losing his idea of home. What is your favorite Walbrook performance?